Hello everyone and thank you for attending today's webinar, Shaping the Future of Open RAM, sponsored by Tech Mahindra and Intel. Before we begin, I wanted to cover a few housekeeping items. On the left hand side of your screen is a Q&A. If you have any questions during the webcast, you can type your question into the Q&A box and submit your questions to our speakers. All questions will be saved, so if we don't get to answer you, we may follow up via email. At the bottom of your audience console are multiple application widgets you can use. If you have any technical difficulties, please click on the yellow help widget. Here you can find answers to common questions. A copy of today's slide deck is available for download in the green resource list widget. Towards the end of today's presentation, please complete the survey on the right hand side of your screen. It will only take one minute to complete and your feedback is extremely helpful. An on-demand version of the webcast will be available about one day after the event and can be accessed using the same audience link that was sent to you earlier today. And now let's turn the event over to our principal analyst at Heavy Readings, Gabriel Brown. Gabriel? So uh, hello everybody uh, and welcome to today's webinar on the future of Open RAN. It's great to have you with us. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, Open RAN is a way to build and operate low-cost, scalable, and programmable radio infrastructure. Uh, to varying degrees, it's being adopted around the world for different use cases and, and over different time frames, but pretty broadly now. Um, in this session, we're going to discuss the future of Open RAN. Now, in many ways, this is a, a grand title uh, because up until now, Open RAN has been, albeit we're seeing some adoption, more or less a proposal and a promise. So, one of the things we important things to discuss before we get too far ahead of ourselves is the state of play in Open RAN today uh, and to ask how ready for scale operations Open RAN really is. Uh, from there, we can then look at the potential evolutions of this technology approach. Um, one thing I think is interesting in this context is to think about how Open RAN informs or even becomes what we might think of as next generation RAN. Uh, so rather than being something we think of as an alternative to the classic model uh, and compared one against the other, perhaps at some point we have some kind of um, combination or co-evolution of, 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 of these two tracks. So it's kind of a personal view, I guess, but something I think is quite important to think about as we look uh, toward the future rather than just the immediate kind of market structure and setup we have uh, right now. So my name is Gabriel Brown. I'm Principal Analyst with Heavy Reading, uh, where I lead our mobile network coverage. I'm also your moderator for today. Uh, I'm joined uh, by three uh, uh, really great uh, guest speakers. Um, and I'm going to ask each of them to sort of say a few words about themselves now. Starting, I'll uh, start with uh, Iago Lopez from TPG Telecom. Iago is general manager for wireless and transmission networks uh, at, at, at the operator. Iago, um, terrific to have you with us. Um, could you just say, you know, perhaps a, a few words about yourself and, and TPG Telecom for those who don't know, you know, uh, who the operator is. Hey, Gabriel, thank you very much for having me here. So, yeah, I think, you know, it's important to, to talk about TPE Telecom. So, um, the company was created about a year and a half ago, and it comes from the merger of uh, TPG, and uh, uh, TPG was a second ISP in Australia and Vodafone Australia. So, basically, with the merger, we merged um, uh, a very strong mobile player as, as Vodafone um, is in Australia, and the second ISP creating a total telecom provider that, you know, it's a second provider on MBN and, uh, and one of the strongest uh, mobile providers in, in Oceania. And I'm responsible yeah, of the okay, wireless, uh, wireless networks. Yeah, okay, good stuff. And we'll talk a little bit more about TPG and the different brands and, and consumer brands and retail brands that, that, that sit within it as, as we go through. Um, Manish uh, Mangal, Global Business Head for Network Services at Tech Mahindra. Welcome, Manish. On mute. Okay, well, well let's move on. Adnan uh, Bustani from, um, from Intel, Director of Wireless Access Business Unit. Welcome, Adnan. Could you say a couple hey, words guys. about yourself? Yeah, sure. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Adnan Bustani. I'm, I actually work at Intel. I'm in what they call the Wireless Access Network Division, which is part of Network and Edge EU. Um, so in my role at Intel, I'm really focused on VRAN, open RAN technologies, essentially how to bring those kind of new 
kind of architectures to the market. The way we do this at Intel is what we call the Flextron solution or Flextron architecture. And the focus for us there is to help our customers enable RAND solutions essentially run on GPP platforms, specifically in the case of Intel on the Xeon GPP uh, solution. I came into Intel back in February 2014. At the time, I was working for a company called Mindspeed, which was actually the wireless division of Mindspeed was acquired by Intel. Uh, and prior to Mindspeed, I used to work at Picochip, which they were, did a lot of work on enabling solutions for WiMAX, 3G, 4G. And prior to that, I used to work in the, in the Wi-Fi technologies domain as well. Yeah, okay, good stuff. Thank you, Adnan. Um, I'm going to go back to Manish because we had a little problem with his audio there. Manish, if you can hear me, um, please just, just introduce yourself. Absolutely, Gabriel. Can you hear me now? I certainly can. Absolutely. Good morning, good afternoon, and uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, very excited to be on this uh, session today and looking forward to an, uh, an amazing conversation on a topic that is uh, very key to our future of the industry. My name is Manish Mangal. I had the global business of IG and network services at Tech And as the leading uh, system integrator in the network services space, we work with global operators in helping drive the transformation journey as part of their uh, evolution of the future of the network. Uh, and uh, we pride ourselves to be a trusted transformation partners uh, for the industry in, in helping drive the future of the network. So looking forward to the, the amazing Open RAN conversation today. Okay, good stuff. Thank you, Manish. So in terms of agenda, what we're going to do, I'm actually going to do some um, short uh, uh, Q&A, fireside chat style Q&A with each of the three speakers in the order you can see here, starting with Yago at TPG, Adnan at Intel, and Manish at Tech, uh, Tech M. We'll then roll into a panel discussion in Q&A. I do, of course, have some pre-prepared talking points, as always, and we kind of have a, a, a structure around it. However, it'd be really great if you do have a question. I see there's already three or four questions been submitted. Please submit them via the Q&A tab on your screen, uh, and we'll look to you know, put those to the speakers a little bit as we go through and also during the uh, panel session itself. So rather than keep them at the end, I'm going to try and um, uh, work them in. Um, now, we're going to move to the first section, which is a fireside uh, a chat with Iago Lopez at TPG. Yago, I can see your icon here, but I'm not sure mm -hmm. if I can see your video. Is your, is your video uh, camera switched on? Yeah, my camera is switched on, but I'm having some technical issues, which I'm doing the troubleshooting with the guys. I have selected the camera, so I don't know if you just want to probably go to the um, to the next presenter and while well, I try to work this um, these technical issues. Sure, we can do that. Um, what did, what normally happens, uh, Yago, with these, I found is a, a quick F5 refresh on your browser fixes most things. The, the turn it on and off again uh, kind of fix. Um, okay, let, let's do that. Um, that's going to put uh, you, Adnan, in right away into the hot seat then, I think. Oh, there we are. Okay. Yago's there. Brilliant. Okay. Sorry, guys. Sometimes you just need to refresh, you know, like <laughs> getting it out. Like, yeah, yeah. That's the... Key troubleshooting. So, yeah, sorry for sorry for the delay, guys. Hey, no problem. Great to have you. So, um, first of all, thanks for joining. Um, you, you introduced TPG Telecom uh, a moment ago, but could you just kind of tell us a little bit? You know, what what are some of the brands? What are the businesses that make up TPG Telecom? Yeah, look, it's a it's a bit exciting story. So, you know, back in up to 2018, there was a company. Uh, called TPG and under TPG, which was basically a um, fixed and enterprise, very strong fixed and enterprise uh, presence in Australia with uh, about 50,000 kilometers of uh, uh, fiber, international submarine cables and, and so on. So very heavy on the asset side from a transmission point of view. And on a consumer side, they have uh, very strong brands in Australia, which um, were IINet, TPG, APT, uh, Internode, which uh, had very good presence on the fixed space in both um, enterprise and consumer. So that was one side of the merger. And then in the other side of the merger, we have Vodafone Australia, which is uh, known by by lots of you, the, obviously the Vodafone brand, which in Australia was already a joint venture between Vodafone and Hutchinson. Hutchinson is known in Europe as uh, three. So we, three. we okay. were already yeah. a, a joint venture of two very big global um, 
mobile operators like Vodafone and uh, and Hatch. And Vodafone was mainly um, mobile. So we have a very strong presence in mobile with about 96% of population coverage in 4G, for example, uh, but quite low on, on the fixed assets and on the fixed presence. We did a little bit of resale of uh, MBM, but at the end of the day, the the merger was kind of a match made in heaven in the sense of we have lots of assets from a, a fixed point of view, plus a very strong consumer brands on, on the fixed side. And then we have um, a state-of-the-art network on uh, on the mobile side with all the mobile global DNA from mobile that we get from both Hutchinson and Butterfield. So obviously uh, that has created a new company that is the clear example of one on one, one plus one is more than two, because definitely mm-hmm. the the opportunity that we have to cross sell uh, across brands, but also from an infrastructure point of view to be able to do more with less, because obviously we, we don't need to, to use third parties as much as we had to do in the past from a mobile perspective, all the transport and uh, IP transit and so on, uh, all the ASP functions can be done in-house. And then obviously from a fixed perspective, uh, now we have a mobile network that uh, that we can get, you know, uh, where the cable doesn't go, you can you can always use wireless. So that's, uh, that's part of our key strategy. Sure, okay, so that, 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 that's a good background. Now, you put these companies together, you've got a stronger proposition, and that's obviously quite, you know, quite, quite a bit of work and a challenge, but a, a, but a good opportunity. You're then, I guess, hit by some of the some of the restrictions around Huawei in Aus, in Australia, from the first countries to sort of um, uh, bring that in a little bit. Um, now, we won't go too much into all of that side of things, yeah. but just give us briefly, you know, kind of what happened. You, you've, uh, as I understand it, you've you're, you're involved in a in a I don't know, a swap of some kind. What, 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 what's the story there? Yeah, basically, uh, up to 2018, when the ban was announced in, in August, a uh, Vodafone network for both radio and transmission was 100% Huawei. So we had a unique vendor strategy. We always talked for 5G to uh, incremental upgrade of the 4G platform uh, that we had from Huawei. And then on the TPG side, uh, we had um, a small cell network in the metropolitan areas that was also Huawei on 4G, uh, which always... We always had the the, um, the aim to to do the incremental upgrade to of the platform to bring 5G and and obviously at that point when the ban came we just realized that look, we we just need to come with something new we need to do something different because uh, Huawei is not a strategic partner towards 5G and we need to come with a new plan and we need to definitely use innovation to to get where we want to be because obviously this is bringing a delay and an extra cost to us and our competitors are not going to stop so. We definitely had to go back to the drawing board, but going back to the drawing board with the mentality that we need to bring innovation and do things in a different way uh, than the normal BAU process that we had before, because otherwise uh, we would never catch up with competitors and we would never take the advantage of uh, building something new. You know, like on the flip side of the full knockdown of the network is that you have the opportunity to, you know, build a greenfield network. Yeah. So probably calling it a swap's not not the best phrasing. I mean that kind of implies like for like. Really, you understand it. it's a, it's a it's a chance to be different and disruptive and 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 bring in yeah. a new platform from from scratch. Really, what 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 are some of the advantages you get out of that? I think in um, if I understand you've you, you've you've brought in Nokia for the four G five G RAN. How, how does having a starting from a not a clean slate, but having how, how do you turn this into an opportunity? I guess. Yeah, I think look, one of the key things is that because we need to do a full swap of the whole the entire network, we every piece of equipment that we are putting on the on the network today is 5G native, so standalone 5G native. So basically, even if some of the spectrum uh, bands are used today for 3G or 4G, everything is gonna every every band that we are deploying uh, can be remotely activated uh, into 5G. But also, we are one of the first operators in the world that is doing a 5G uh, standalone core and production. You know, that we have mm-hmm. that right now, if you're a customer in Australia, you could have a standalone core uh, in the production network. And, and, you know, we are offering already over 90% of population coverage in, in the metropolitan area. So all that innovation that we bring up, we need to do it uh, from the scratch. It, it really gets uh, on the customer end very quickly because right now, uh, you know, I, I have a standalone core on my, on my device and I have 5G almost everywhere in Sydney. Yeah, terrific. Okay, so let's bring this now to the, the subject of the, today's session, Open RAN. How does how does Open RAN kind of play into this uh, this strategy here? What's your 
what's your thinking? Why are you interested in, in, in that technology? I think for us, basically, we, we are we are interested in open run on, on the medium term. So right now, what we are doing is uh, doing a lot of work on the virtual run side. So we have done trials in Australia, first, and, first operator in Australia to do trials with a virtual run. And now we are moving towards the classification uh, this year. So we have a partner, um, Samsung, which we are working on on that. And probably once we finish the qualification phase, we definitely would be working on a, on an open interface. So we are really working a little bit backwards, like trying to understand every step of the process. So going first on the virtualization of the of the baseband, which I think it's one of the key the key components that would help us to be more flexible on over rollout. Cloudification it gives you the agility of deployment, so that's the mm -hmm. uh, very big step for us to do this year. And then once we get those two parts clear, I think we would be in a very good position uh, to bring an open one solution. Then what we need to really mm -hmm. understand is where where does it apply? I think you made a good point uh, starting this conversation today, which we say, look, it's not a competing, it's not like a, you have the or the. Ericsson's, Nokia's, Huawei's of the wall, and then you have an open run and they are competing. It's really to work now on, on what are those cases where, which which solution applies where, and, and we are doing a lot of work on that to understand, you know, how to use open run as part of the portfolio. Mm -hmm. And as you go through the, you know, this this phase, the technical exploration and the, you know, the, the use cases and so forth, to what extent are you engaged with sort of peer operators globally or even some of the different groups you know the oran alliance the telecom infra project um you know yeah, your, your peers mean, in different markets whether that's yeah, asia pac or europe or us how, how, how are you part of that community definitely we are very embedded on the industry and and you know having two global partners uh, like a uh, hutchinson and vodafone group gives you access to to information that probably not all every operator in the world can have but i think uh, every country is a little bit different so you need to do your due diligence in countries. So, you know, some countries where you have a spectrum set aside for industry, the open run business case is a little bit uh, more straightforward. That's not the case in Australia. So, you know, it, it gets to a point where where you you cannot get the technology, lots of value from technology that you learn from partners overseas. And in our case, we are extremely lucky to have um, Vodafone Group uh, and the uh, Hutchinson Group, which is uh, a, a good flow of information there. But you need to do your due diligence in house because every market is different, regulator regulation is different, mm -hmm. and then everything applies on the on the mix. So, learning technology from over peers and partners it's something that we we are always uh, keen on doing. But you need to do your due diligence in house. So that's what we are trying to do now mm -hmm. with uh, all our beer and uh, evolution towards Oran. Yeah, yeah, good stuff. Um, what do you, do, you, do you, at this point, do you have a sense of where you might use Open RAN first? Would you use it for, I know I'll chuck a couple of ideas at you. Would you use it for fixed wireless? Would you use it for a, a rural coverage, an urban system, an indoor system? Uh, I don't know. Do you have any sense yet where, 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 where you might apply it? I think it's, uh, for me, private network seems to be uh, one of the points where it would make sense. Uh, if you don't need a carrier grade network, uh, you know, it, it kind of helps to to reduce TCO. You know, like if you have a, a network that gives a machine-to-machine, a -machine, for example, service that doesn't require uh, the same level of um, uh, you know performance that you need on a on a commercial uh, network, that would definitely help to uh, the business case of Oran. You know, like it's all about the TCO of uh, of the whole solution. So I think, on a private network perspective, Oran has a, a part to play. I think on remote rural neutral host, uh, it, it has a part to play, you know, in the sense of mm -hmm. when TCO doesn't work to deploy coverage uh, for one operator, I think Open RAN could be a, a a neat option to bring few operators on board at, uh, again, a low cost. Not You don't need probably that level of performance that you would get on a, on a city, but I mean, coverage is a binarial thing, either you have it or not. So if you have coverage, it's, uh, it's better than uh, not having. But but then once you start to get those uh, fringe business cases, you start to understand where, where it does it play. So going for areas where the performance is not critical and the TCO, it's a problem to deploy, 
I think that's the the areas where Open Run is really find it, its first uh, starting point, and then once you start to be in the process, it, then you're in. You know, like that's that's how the technology itself is going to self-select which way which way it goes, and operators are going to choose it uh, accordingly. Yeah, yeah, of course. And I think um, I think one of the things about Australia as a, as a, as a non-Australian, as a European, but the um, certainly a market where some of the private network has been really pioneered with the, um, you know, the out of town mining and the, all the areas where you need um, connectivity, but you're not necessarily within the, you know, the macro coverage or, 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 or you have the specific um, machine communication needs. Um, what would you say you need the ecosystem and vendor community to address most urgently in, in Open RAN? What, what would be the thing that you think, you know, really, we need to get this done? You talked about the virtualization as, as one phase, but I think, for example, security it's the it's the key the key piece that we need to understand. You know, like uh, obviously there is lots of work, and, and when you hear uh, the telecom infra project, it's, it's lots of work that is happening. Security is one of the key the key areas that they are focusing on. That it's just how to convince uh, the regulators that. Uh, you know, we can do a, a, a mass deployment of open run and on a secure manner, you know, and, and we have seen what has happened in the past in, in places like Australia or, or the US or, you know, the UK. So we just got to kind of uh, work on that, um, on that to, to bring that confidence that uh, that's, you know, it's as secure as any other solution, which, which I believe it could be. We just need to, the, the fact of being so open, it kind of, creates the the different uh, perception uh, yeah, and then yeah, i think yeah. the, the, other, the other piece of an industry is we need to um, i think again there are lots of players talking about open run and very soon we need to decide you know we, we need to know who are the doers who are the talkers you know and, and then start to work with the doers because uh open run is a reality it's uh in the next couple of years we start we are going to start to see a commercial deployments. We have seen already some uh, trials happening in uh, in metropolitan areas in in Europe and and in Africa, and almost in the next few years, everywhere in the world, we are going to start to see open run trials coming in, and and a commercial rollout is is just about to happen. You know, like uh, we see discussions in well, we have Japan and we have uh, the US with this, but we have um, in Germany things just about to happen. So. I think once we start to do the work, we are going to start to see who is talking about open run, who is doing open run, and it's going to help us a lot to the other operators to say, look, these people, they know what they do. We have a commercial model that works. Let's uh, let's engage with them rather than every day on LinkedIn getting somebody that wants to have a chat with me about open run. It kind of becomes too much that I say, look, I, I work with Samsung. I do the work with them on on VRAM because I I can move something a little bit rather than uh, it could be a lot of time waste for an operator right now to to start to engage with all the parties who want to play on open run. Yeah. Okay. Great point. I mean, and in the sense, it, it's quite an open environment. Lots of people with an offer, but you're saying it's going to kind of come down to who who gets it done and where you can get good references and what's what's supportable and things over the over the long term. Good stuff. Well, thank you, Yago. Uh, Yago's going to be back with us on the panel session. Quite a few of these points we're going to pick up again, actually, there. So we want to go a little bit more into it. Um, thank you very much, Yago. I'm just scanning the questions here. I'll try and um, I'll try and look at those when we come to the panel session and crack on with Adnan for now. Um, thank you, uh, Yago. Right. So. Um, second speaker uh, for today is Adnan Bustani from uh, Intel. We had we, we had his um, uh, his basic introduction and earlier. Adnan, um, uh, terrific to have you. Um, we want to talk now uh, a little bit about some of the technology, the future of Open RAN. We know you're going to be a little bit restricted with Mobile World Congress um, next week and various demos and launches and th things that you no doubt. Uh, have got planned and, and won't want to reveal all now in, in advance. But um, let's see what we can cover here. So, Adnan, before we before we uh, look to the future of Open RAN, could you give us uh, a little bit your assessment of, of progress today? How would you characterize the, the state of the, the technology in the market? 
Yeah, thanks, Gabriel. And it is correct. I have to be careful about what I do say because there are certain announcements coming up uh, at MWC. So I recommend everybody who is listening to this webinar, you know, next week start looking to the announcements. We have some pretty exciting stuff coming up. Um, but your questions, Gabriel. So um, if I look over maybe the last couple of years and maybe specifically the last year in terms of where things have gone, um, about 12 months ago, there was a lot of kind of, I would say, commercial product launches. There was operator announcements where various technologies like LTE and 5G were discussed and actually products were launching, you know, users getting connected onto real live networks. I think the last 12 months, uh, there was a bit of a focus within the industry uh, to kind of cover, you know, both sides of the world. So both you know, in Asia, for example, with Japan and Rakuten, what they were launching with their 5G network, but also in the US when the whole C-band auctions was kind of going in motion. So there's a lot of work to make sure that the companies that we work with have the right technology, the right enabling software to bring in the kind of the more demanding use case of 5G, which is typically the massive MIMO, where you have 64 TR antenna systems that are typically deployed at 100 megahertz spectrum. So that actually was a kind of a big focus point for us and our partners last year. And you know, if you kind of look at the press releases, there's lots of announcements of either an operator who has launched in C-band or even a vendor, actually a few vendors who've talked about their C-band products and they referenced like the VRAN technologies that was enabling this. So I think from a technologies point of view, um, the kind of the main pillars of what is necessary for a 4G, a 5G network, all the way to the high end of 5G, has been proven to be commercially ready and commercially deployable as well. Yeah. Okay. Good stuff. Well, I think we'll to maybe try and we well, we talk a bit a bit now, but maybe pick it up again later. The we talked about the VRAN and the virtualized baseband and massive MIMO and C band and that, that sort of thing. That was considered kind of a, a high capacity side application, quite challenging to do on a on general purpose processes and so forth. Um, would you say that sort of on par performance wise in terms of the service it offers to to customers but also when we look in on the internal operations the power consumption the you know cost of servers and baseband units and things like that is it is it is it on par performance wise would you say yeah so i'll maybe break that in two different parts so in terms of feature set uh, wireless performance ttpp compliance i mean all these aspects tend to be you know there's a certain criteria that a vendor has to meet for an operator. I don't think operators would say to one vendor, if you have VRAN, you have a, a kind of a lesser bar to meet. The assumption is that every product has to meet the same set of expectations. So, you know, we have helped our customers achieve this. Um, even our reference implementation that we do within Intel, which is a FlexTran software reference implementation, we kind of demonstrated this internally, shared it with our customers just to show what is possible from a pure, like a GPP platform to meet those very demanding requirements. So that's something that we have achieved. Uh, our partners have achieved it. And I think this is why you've seen some press releases, you know, from both all the way over in Japan in terms of what Rakuten has announced with their products, all the way to in the case of the US, where the C-band launches has also started to happen as well. Now, in terms of the, the other part of this, which is the power side of the equation. so. I mean, traditional RAN, they have the way of obviously, you know, handling power, et cetera. Uh, but for us, in terms of what they're doing to flex RAN architecture, we are now spending quite some time to make it kind of, you know, clear to our partners how best to use like a Xeon or a GPP platform to kind of really optimize the power. And specifically what I'm trying to highlight here is a few things. Uh, the first thing would be that in any 24 hour period, the network is not as demanding or not as loaded as it would be from say peak hour to maybe midnight or very early in the morning. So the ability to take that knowledge and then use a platform in a different way so that you can maybe scale down certain parameters so you can start to save power, I think is a very, very important thing. Um, and in fact, one of the ways that we have been explaining this to our customers is kind of along the line of kind of you know, maybe three levels of kind of met approaches you could do for the power side of things. Uh, the first one is what we call like the application side of the equation. So the application side of thing is where you're within a 24 hour period, 
you know, every hour you can see maybe varying kind of loading of the network. You know, for example, you could be have a visibility into one cell site or many cell sites, and they could be all aggregated to a single server. So the ability to kind of control how the CPU cores are kind of being utilized to kind of basically save power is a very important technology. So for that one, we typically talk to our customers about what we call C states. And C states typically goes from a C1 to C6. C6 is like the deeper sleeping mode. C1 is kind of what we discuss as being shallow. But all these different uh, power state modes from C1 to C6 will actually give you power saving benefits. Uh, and then we go to the next level of discussions, which is typically at the platform level. Now, this is typically not as frequent as you would do with C states, but it does give you benefits in terms of uh, how you control the clock frequencies as an example. So if you did, for example, a Google search on Intel P states, you will see how you, know, you have the ability to play with the clock frequencies. And again, that is something you can do maybe less frequently, but it does give you power savings as well. And then finally, there's another kind of overall approach when you have like a platform that is part of a server, that is part of a rack, then you have the ability to start to introduce the concepts that ORAN has been talking about, specifically class one and class two pooling, where they're trying to look at you know, bigger geographical locations that are all being aggregated to a rack. And then within that rack, you can actually look at the different servers and say, you know what, certain servers are not so busy, others are busy, then let's use the resources a bit more efficiently to deliver an overall power reduction and other features you can get and other benefits, which maybe I'll talk about a bit later on. Yeah. Okay. Good stuff. A bunch of points there to pick up on. We do. I have this in the panel, so I'm going to I'm going to move on to the next point. But um, uh, uh, terrific answer. Thank you. Um, uh, the other area that that, that that everyone's asking a lot about uh, been a big topic through certainly through last year in in in, in my work and loads of these kinds of forums is the um, the architecture side, the inline versus looker side architecture. There's you know essentially the two schools of thought. I'm not sure how different they are, but can you just um, give us your thoughts on, you know, how to how how we should think about that? If we think, of, 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 to, to my understanding, Intel's generally been toward the looker side architecture. Um, you just elaborate a bit on, on on your thoughts there. Sure. So I think I mentioned that I used to work in MindSpeed and PikaChip before. So. My history has been um, working with companies that are designing SOCs for the, the wireless market, even going back to the days of Wi-Fi and then into LTE and 5G. So typically what you have in any SOC, uh, you would have something that's doing what they call baseband processing, like DSP engines. You might have things which are hardware accelerated, like chip rate processing or even FEC functionality, et cetera. Now, if you take that as a, maybe a general approach to designing products for the RAN market, and then look at what we have done at Intel. So with our FlexRAN solution, which usually encompasses two things, you have the hardware side of things, which is the Xeon processor, and then you have the software side of things, which enables the utilization of these hardware features. So the hardware features itself, the way to think about it is, with our Xeon processor, what we have done is we have enabled our customers to use specific instruction sets. So essentially what that means is that a lot of the L1 acceleration that is needed is actually done within the CPU cores. And the way they do this is by utilizing the AVX instruction sets. The AVX instruction sets, specifically AVX 512, which is what's currently available in our processors, uh, that actually helps you implement a lot of the DSP functionality. So from our point of view, um, really that the DU functionality, which is typically the layer one and the layer two, is really implemented within the CPU cores. Uh, if you look into the product portfolio, you will see that um, we do have a device, which is called the ACC100. That is a device that we typically recommend if someone would like to do FEC in a hardware accelerated block. So that's kind of you know, maybe where those kind of architecture discussions come into it is that in some instances, someone could use the, the hardware FEC kind of device for doing that specific functions, but really the majority of the DU uh, baseband processing is happening within the CPU. And this is something that we have demonstrated, you know, starting off with standard MIMO, 
which was for both LTE and 5G. And then we did it for Massive MIMO, which I spoke about as a focus point for 2020, 2021, and to kind of get to the point where we have vendors who are currently launching. Uh, and maybe one more point I would have had here is that the reason why we did this approach is because from the onset of kind of trying to do open RAN and VRAN, you know, there, there was a kind of a, a goal to bring all the benefits of, for example, cloud native architectures, all the scaling capabilities, and to make this available across all the DU workloads. And by that, I mean the L1 and the L2. So we were kind of very focused on making sure and maximizing how much of the L1 is running on a CPU and the same thing for the L2. So that when someone starts to do like certain cloud native features like you know pooling, pod scaling, all these different features, that they can do it across everything, L1 and L2 as well. Mm -hmm. So th that helps with the pooling that you were talking about previously, if, you, if you're doing yes. it on the, on the CPU, yeah. Correct. Um, we're going to come back to, again, some of this is time permitting. Another area I just wanted to, to pick you up on a little bit, um, more and more interesting is this idea that, well, if you're running a, a DU at a cell site, on a server at a cell site, for example, um, could you also run the cell site gateway, the router that typically would connect the base um, the base station to the transport network? So classically, a mobile operator will have the baseband unit, maybe an IP interface, but they'll go to a cell site gateway, maybe even back-to-back -back cell site gateways in some cases is, is not unknown. One of the sort of hottish trends, I would say, hot trends is this idea that, well, you can put a DU and a software a CSR, cell site router, all on the same server. Is that a... Is that a thing that, 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 that you think we'll see in, in 2022? Yeah, I think so. Um, I mean, virtual routing in general, be it for any part of the network, has been you know worked on, products developed for quite some time, all the way even to the CPE market. Um, I think in the terms of actual the RAN world, and specifically, as you mentioned, um, like a cell site deployment, um, one of the beauties of having like a GPP platform, so it has general processing capability, is the ability to utilize spare capacity for new functions. And one good example of these functions is the ability to do something like a cell site router on that DU platform that's hosted at cell site. Now, you know, obviously there, there's always a kind of a, how do I say, like just kind of a trade-off between how much of the CPU resources you want to allocate versus how much throughput you want to achieve. Um, but there are partners out there who have kind of come up with specific kind of calculations of you know, a typical cell site that's typically doing three sectors, what is the expected, example, in this case here, expected mid-haul throughput required of processing from mm -hmm. the various radios for the three sectors back to your CU, back into the core network. So in, in that case, we have actually worked with some partners who have essentially optimized their software to make it quite efficient on a, like a Xeon processor in this case for a DU to run this kind of functionality as well. So I, I agree with you. It is something that is quite interesting. I think there's even a product out there that has launched that talks about this Juniper software, which is the Rackets and Simware. If you see their press releases, they do talk about this. And I think it's a very exciting use case that shows you know, the benefits of having GPP platform, which is you can use it for you know, obviously RAN, but for other functions related to the RAN as well. Yeah. Okay. Good stuff. So I'm going to move on to, to Manish, um, but, but we'll have you back on the on the panel session. We'll also ask Yago. I'll ask Yago about that um, integrating the, the the base station and, and cell site router because obviously it's also an organisational issue. Um, classically, an, a mobile operator has a transport team and a RAN team, and they kind of you know obviously they know each other, but but they're different teams. Putting it all together is going to have an organisational impact uh, as well. Try to see if we can get Yago on that one. Um, Adnan, thank you uh, very much. So uh, if I could now um, ask Manish to turn his camera on. Um, hi, Manish, are you there? Yes, I'm here, Gabriel. Thank you ever so much for your patience, Manish. Um, great to have you with us today. Um, so first question, Open Run Technology, we've made a decent amount of progress, um, certainly as Adnan was talking about there on, on the technology. We can see some live examples. Um, for many operators, as Yago's talking about, the next stage is putting, you know, a deployable and operable solution together. So, so what needs to happen to take it from a, a technology solution to something that's that's deployable and at scale? 
No, absolutely. I think, I think uh, Gabriel, as we look at the life cycle of a technology, there are typically three components to that life cycle. There is an innovation part where just the basic capability of the technology, which is standardized uh, functions, software availability, and which is what uh, Adnan was talking about from the chipset perspective, having the right flex and architecture there and having the RU, DU, CU components that are available in the market with open specifications. Uh, the second uh, very important part, particularly into the new age of building the networks, which is open networks, is a pre-integration, which is the ability for the multiple components to work together in a systematic fashion. So it still looks, uh, looks and performs like a one integrated system, but it's like a Lego blocks where you've got multiple different blocks that can be pieced together to create a system. And that's really the beauty of these open networks is that you can mix and match and you have the flexibility of picking the right innovation partners across the value chain. Uh, but you do need to have a pre-integrated stack that is proven, that is benchmarked, that is performance guaranteed to be able to work. The third is really to be able to bring it to life, which is deploying it into the field. And uh, that has a cycle of planning, design, and, and deployment in the field such that it actually performs in the real world the way we are expected to do. And it also aligns with what you just recently described as the, the organizational patterns, which is, you know, every operator has a particular structure of how they adopt new technologies, integrate in their environment and operate it. Uh, and a new technology as disruptive as Open RAN is, is really trying to solve two problems. For a green field, it's opening the, the, the uh, framework of innovation. It's opening really the, the opportunities to go beyond the way traditional networks are designed and operated. So not only just bringing the right technology stack, but also changing the organization structure as well. How do you bring in more DevOps-based uh, practices to operating your network so that you're not doing a traditional waterfall approach where you've got a planning team, you've got a design team, and they all kind of flow from each other, but you start to break down uh, to look at this open system. So, so organization structures, how you operate that network is, is really transforming. So it's no surprise that all the greenfield networks that have come about in the last three years, all the decisions that have been made, have all chosen Open RAN as the architecture of choice. And I think the debate about whether Open RAN gives value and the benefits and the right PCO, I think that's that's a little bit uh, history from my perspective. Uh, definitely for the greenfield. Now for the green uh, brownfield operators, where there is an existing set of infrastructures, existing set of practices. How do you overlay a new architecture, get the benefit of that architecture in a short term, while at the same time drive the value from a long-term perspective so that we are not, we are not uh, restricting ourselves in the full capability of that. And that's where I think VC is bringing to life, like you said, and how do you scale it up, right? Uh, taking a pre-integrated stack that is performance benchmarked and performance guaranteed so that when operators take that as a stack, they can pick and choose the partners. They can pick and say which RU I want, which DU, CU, and which what kind of infrastructure that I want to build on, whether it's for in-building, whether it's for my overlay sites, whether it is for my uh, coverage expansion, depends on whatever strategy uh, can be chosen. But once they pick on the architecture, uh, somebody like us coming in and saying, we'll help you achieve the same benefits that you would have achieved if it was a single RAN uh, solution where it is a pre-integrated stack, it is a, uh, the performance is, is guaranteed and there are SLAs associated with it that we are willing to take to help you drive and adopt this new architecture and, and de-risk the implementation of it. To me, that's a very important step in getting the brownfield operators to adopt this architecture, and we are seeing that. Uh, you know, there are several of the oper uh, operators globally who have publicly stated now that the open RAN architecture is the way for them to do it. They are already buying into that. Uh, you know, uh, we have been announced as a partner with several of them, uh, and we think that uh, give us a, give another year or two, while this has already become mainstream, I expect this to become a completely mainstream from a deployment perspective as well. And and there is a lot of history uh, in terms of how technologies get adopted. And we can, if we have time permitting, I can explain a bit of how we all saw Volti and IMS go through the same technology curve. And now you don't even ask a question about whether we need a 2G, 3G circuit switch based voice services, or it's all going to be a Volti based service. It, it has become industry standard. 
Yeah, yeah. OK. So just um, last question before we go to the panel. We've taken longer than I planned, as, as always, with these things, but so much good stuff to talk about. Um, when we think about just digging a little bit into the, the operating model for a brownfield operator, classically, the, the, the vendor operator relationship is something that's existed for decades. The people know each other. The vendor actually knows the operator network. So they have this relationship. So they kind of co-design the network very often. They work together on deployment, commissioning the sites, optimizing it through the life cycle, planning the upgrades and the capacity increase and so forth. There's a whole workflow and operating model that, that goes with it that's well entrenched and, you know, let's say pretty successful. Um, does Open RAN, what does it need to do? Does it need to replicate that model or or break it down and somehow figure out a better way to do it? What's the, and, and then, is that a tech M who comes in and becomes the vendor? How do you just kind of, you know, it's not just a technology and a product, it's the whole delivery uh, process as well. Indeed, indeed. I, I think the fundamental, Gabriel, to that is, uh, traditionally when RAN was a single network, it was basically one, one platform, if you look at it. Hardware, software, services, every integrated combined together as comes as a package. Uh, the velocity that is required by the operators now to be able to innovate, to support the the emerging worlds. I mean, we are you know we are talking about a metaverse coming to life here, and it's going to completely transform the way consumers and even the enterprises are going to use uh, 5G networks or even beyond that. And and the number one requirement for an operator is going to be to move with a very high velocity in augmenting the features, augmenting capabilities to support that. And which basically means that the network have to be turned into a software platform. That's the, I mean, we have learned through every life cycle of anything where anything that becomes a software and connected can transform uh, rather quickly. Really Open RAN is all about changing the network from an integrated hardware centric uh, platform to a, a very software centric platform. Now, yes, this basically means that there will be a newer player in the ecosystem that will have to come to help that because the expertise required for this is going to be very different. You are going to require a lot more software-centric expertise. You are going to require a lot more predictive analytical capabilities with AI type of toolkits that needs to come into operations of the network. You are going to require a combination of a skill sets that uh, is DevOps type of a uh, skill sets to deploy and operate this kind of a network. So there is indeed a necessity to break apart the supplier uh, value chain and who supplies what components. And this is where, uh, you know, I think from our perspective, having the network and the software expertise, we are coming in to help achieve that vision for the for the operators. Uh, and by no means, it's a replacement to everybody who has been. This is just an expansion of the opportunities in the marketplace where this new architecture will enable for a new emerging set of players like ourselves to be able to help drive this 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 architecture which is absolutely required i don't think that's the question anymore yeah okay okay good stuff thank you manish so stay with us we're going to move to the the panel discussion um my first topic i'm going to push out now we've dealt with quite a lot of this already um and so i'm going to sort of uh breeze through the first few bullets uh, to some extent obviously pick it up guys if you if you, if you want to do to 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 to, to address anything there but Adnan at Intel first, and then maybe Yago and Manish back in. Um, one of the questions actually on the on the on the audience Q and A is, um, can you tell us about Cloud RAN? What I wanted to hear, Adnan, how 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 should we think about moving from 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 a VRAN to an Open RAN, really to a Cloud Native RAN? What does what does Cloud Native RAN uh, mean to you? How would you you know what would be some of the characteristics uh, of that? Okay, sure. So maybe I, I can probably look at um, those first three bullet points actually combined together because that's an interesting question about single vendor DURU. I think sometimes when we look about these topics and let's say there's a specific operator who's using the same vendor for the DU and RU, you know, which it's good in its own right, but people might forget that actually there's other elements here that are kind of go within the principles of you know, VRAN, OpenRAN, because remember when you're doing a VRAN open and deployment, there's a few aspects here. There's a first thing which is to do with the hardware software disaggregation. You know, historically the hardware and software came from the same vendor. 
now we're in a, in a phase where actually the hardware can come from a, a traditional server provider and the software then comes from a more traditional RAN provider. So there's plenty of examples of this. Now the other part of this is also the operating system. So what's typically called the cast layer. So again, you know, even in these deployments you will hear about the cast layers coming from specific vendors, you know, could be the likes of Wind River, Red Hat, VMware, or even Robin IO, all these different vendors. It's a kind of a new element in the overall ecosystem. So I'm telling all this because it is important to remember that, you know, if this is the case for some operators where they have the same vendor for DU or U, but actually there's elements in there that are still following the VRAN, open RAN principles in their own way as well. Because I saw a comment in the audience, someone asking about, you know, open RAN, et cetera, is what, what's the point of it if it's, I don't know, 1% in a certain time frame, But in reality, it's more than that. And I think that journey has already begun even in the US, because I think someone made a comment about the US is not doing open RAN. Remember, please, that open RAN has a few elements. It is true that open interfaces is one part of it, but VRAN is another part and so on and so on. So you, you don't have to do everything to be officially doing all the open RAN. There could be a VRAN aspect of it as well. Now, to your question about what, what is the key steps on transitioning from say VRAN to open RAN. So I kind of, you know, alluded on this kind of link to the cloud native, which is, I think today there's already operators and vendors who are doing actually both of them. I mean, if you look at the European side of the equation, a lot of them are kind of going down the open run path very, very quickly. And by that, I mean, they're not only doing the virtualization, but they also want to do the, the kind of the multi-vendor RUDU scenario as well. Uh, maybe slightly different in the US, although that's not in all cases, because if you know DISH is doing it also more like um, in an open run fashion where they have announced like multiple vendors for the DU, for the RU, uh, the OS layer, and, I mean, and um, even have multiple J vendors. Japan as well, right? For, for multi-vendor yeah. uh, DUs, Japan's a big... Um... Correct. So I, I think yeah. the truth is, I think both models exist today. There's operators who are doing everything with the VRAM plus the multi-vendor between the DU and the RU. There's others who are doing the VRAN, but they're keeping maybe the DU RU vendor the same. But it's all in the right direction. You know, it all shows how these new technologies are helping them enable these kind of capabilities. Now, the cloud yeah. native okay, so, aspect um, of this is, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Okay, so I was just going to try and bring uh, Yago in, because Yago, if I understood previously, you're starting with the VRAN trials and going to do multi-vendor DURU at a later phase. Is that right? And what, what, yeah, why did so, you do it that way around? I think for us, it's just the, comp the reduced complexity and, and go one step at a time. So when we are reducing the complexity now is we are using Samsung for the DURU. DU and, and the first step was the, the VRAN component and using a commodity hardware to, to run the application. So for us, it's a, it's a good way to focus on, on the understanding. And there's lots of parts to play on the, on the VRAN, you know, like a, the operating system. And I, and I think that's a very good point that Adnan made, which is not just about the VRAN, um, the view and, uh, and our use, like lots of components that we need to go through. So basically, we reduce variation at the beginning. So getting Samsung to help us on the coordination of uh, all other parts. So we do a single single vendor DURU, but then first we did last year millimeter wave, um, a five G millimeter wave on a virtualized in a virtualized environment using a off the shelf uh, Dell server. And now we are going through the process of cloud native. And then once we get all the backend uh, working, we are happy to go towards a uh, uh, distributed. Uh, you know, not distribute like a, a different vendor to URU, which I don't think is the key. I mean, it, it's important because you bring competition, but it's not the key benefit that you get. Having a different vendor is not the key advancement that Open Run is bringing you. I think the cloudification and virtualization are giving you more um, leapfrog mm -hmm. uh, opportunities than the fact of using a different vendor. But but obviously, it's part of the it's part of the question. I think. Uh, and then made a point and, and also Manish about if you have a Greenfield network, you know, like lots of operators in Europe that are Greenfield, they go on or Japan, they could go straight on the final solution, which is, look, I'm, I'm going to have an economy of scale. So I need to really force the supply chain to give us, a, I need to bring more vendors to, to get a better a value. We are still on trial phase uh, because we, we obviously have a, a customer base already. So it kind of... Um, 
makes sense for us not to try to complicate at the beginning so we can get results uh, we can we can uh, get clear progress as we go but uh, but yeah obviously the URU if we're gonna go into a mass deployment that's gonna be something that uh, you need to you need to reevaluate because that's what can can bring you the economy of scale on the on the hardware and the software which a unique uh, if you use a unique vendor is a little bit more complex yeah, and just just staying with you, Yago, on the on the VRAN side, um, are you? Um, uh, perhaps you could just tell us, or if you don't want to, don't. But what what, what would you say is the 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 key differences between a you know VM based and containerized um, uh, DU applications? Is is that a transition where you have to go direct to containerized now, or is is you know can you can you have a, a VM based um, deployment and, and and evolve it? I think it really depends on the architecture and the use that you want to have. I think deploy a radio, you know, like let's discuss about the telemetry wave or private networks. You can do a very fast deployment because all your your infrastructure is there. You just need to put the radio and it becomes like a loading a patch for security or a loading a, a router, you know, on your on your hardware. So all the architecture is there. And just as a BNF, you can put a radio system without having to have separate transmission and a, a separate radio system, mm -hmm. a BBU. So it can help you a lot on that way. In a brownfield network, you already have um, basements in every, you have a shelter in every tower and you have the basements already there. You need to find what the business case is because the basement cost is not the, is not the problem. And if you already pay rent for the shelter, it doesn't really uh, help you uh, to have a Dell micro, you know, a, a big server that is going to cost you more, but it also helps you to it, to build mini DCs on your shelter. So if you want to have, a, you know, something that we are all thinking about, millimeter wave uh, densification, smaller cells in in metropolitan areas or for fixed wireless access, then you can use your shelters on a B1 architecture to be a mini DC to control, um, you know, as a to control in a VRAN architecture the deployment of uh, of new cells very quickly, you know, and, and it kind of removes so, the um, yeah time to deploy. So maybe using the the shelter as like a hub site for for, for these small yeah. cells. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Every 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 operator would be different. If you need to start from the beginning, probably you wouldn't have a shelter, you know, on a, on a mm -hmm. brownfield uh, on a greenfield network, but you know you need to use the assets that you have and, and some of the options is obviously to use a combination of uh, traditional and um, B run and B run it helps you definitely to have a faster deployment of applications you know on and i think the this the higher frequencies are definitely need that you know like uh, you need to get volume in and volume needs time to market and reduce cost of deployment and that's where i think um, a B run uh, would have a, a a massive part yeah. of the, and we can see that uh, in our trials. Yeah. Okay. Good stuff. So we've pretty much come to the end. We've got two minutes left. So it's gone really quickly. I didn't even get Manish back in on this uh, on this session. Um, so just to, uh, really quick to close it out, Yago, I'll go back to you again, just because I, I'm reminded of your job title, um, General Manager Wireless and Transmission Network. So. Um, tell us why it makes sense to put wireless and transmission together in, in the context of what you just said about about um, building out a dense network. Yeah, basically, I mean, and traditionally separated walls that probably they don't talk that much to each other. You give me connectivity is binary. So I need connectivity point to point from this BTS to the core network, and and that's the way it happens. But right now, when you plan a network, you really need to understand the transport component, and then when you when you do a distribution of uh, the URU, like a front hauling becomes your, you know, like the, the big uh, the big problem you try to solve. So just to give you an idea, in my case, I have a wireless team, and then the transmission team is the one that has the virtual run trial. They are the one managing the virtual run trial. I manage more from the transport side than I do from, mm -hmm. the, from the radio side. The radio side, very important, but, you know, you got to focus on what happens between the BTS and the device. And, and you know your mm -hmm. coverage layer, which doesn't change that much. Uh, you know, it's just the power that you use and, and, and what uh, level of MIMO and so on and the frequencies. But the, the transport is really the 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 one that the, this architecture changed dramatically, and, and all your mm -hmm. virtualization layer on the core. So 
in my in my organization the virtual run trial is managed by the head of transmission just yeah okay uh, good stuff how, how we got, we got that. are getting together yeah 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 thank you yeah. very much i yeah, guess yeah, gonna jump on no, many thing, thank you so much for your time very nice See to you, meet thank, you guys thank you very much uh, Yago lopez from tpg it's great to have you uh, adnan bustani from intel thank you <laughs> And Manish Mangal from Tech Mahindra. Thanks, Manish. Great to have you. Thank you. Um, so uh, thanks for listening. Thank you and goodbye.